Hello, everybody. It is June the 11th, 2021. That was the week time, Friday afternoon, um, early afternoon, Pacific Coast time. Keith, this is the end of your week. You always celebrate, you said afterwards. What did you do? Have an orgy or something? Well, you know, that may have been true uh, about, let's see, 40 years ago. That would have been a, a reasonable plan for a Friday evening, but not anymore, Andrew. So what do you do? Have a cup of tea and a new and a snooze? And an English muffin with toast and marmalade. That sounds very vulgar, very indulgent, Keith. Well, I'm looking Depends for what signals. You do. <laughs> I, I, I always rely on this. I look forward to it too, although it's not the end of my week. Um, but I'm always looking for signals from you, Keith. So do we have a green or a red light on tech for this week? As you can see, Andrew, we have got... Both. Both? Oh, Keith, that's too confusing. Why have we got both? Um, because if you look at the news of the week, there are massively conflicting um, uh, uh, trends uh, or evidence of conflicting end games. Um, it's dialectical, Andrew. As, as a former okay. sociology professor, it's dialectical. You know that both things are happening at the same time, but you don't know which one is going to win. So explain the, the dialectic uh, this week, Keith. What are the two things in opposition? Well, the, the, the first thing is that the technology ecosystem is just expanding a, a, at a huge rate. Um, I, I highlight an article from two years ago by Elad Gill, who is, one of, is the top performing angel in the world as an investor. Even uh, more than Paul Graham? even more than Paul Graham. And in his article from two years ago, the title was Markets Are Ten Times Bigger Than Ever. Yeah. And uh, he had a list of companies and their valuations. Salesforce, for example, was $120 billion then. So in my editorial, I point out that it's grown 10 times more since then. Um, not for Salesforce, it's just it's, it's doubled. Uh, they're now at $222 billion. Yeah, Salesforce, Google, actually, in an interesting way, Salesforce doesn't seem to be a miracle company anymore. It used to be, but now it, it's being eclipsed by others. Yeah, well, it's still massive. It's it's worth $200 billion, but Google, by contrast, is worth $1.66 trillion. Yeah. So, so it's a small company by comparison to Google. But the, the other point he makes is that there's going to be a lot more uh, – decacorns not unicorns and this from two years ago well two years later we're seeing a lot of companies achieve a hundred billion dollars of valuation when they go public so so just what, what are some examples of that um examples of that would be uh, airbnb is coinbase. getting getting close to that coinbase didn't, didn't quite reach but it's getting close to it it's way more than 10 billion anyway all of them yeah um a firm uh, you know, there's there's a long list of them um, when they go public. So so tech is driving huge, huge amounts of value. On the other hand, and here's the red light, the G7 met this week and said these global companies have been able to escape local taxation due to being global. The G7 is now going to globally set a tax rate of 15% on them uh, for every amount of um, profit they make above 10% in the country that they make it. And it's the first time that I can recall a global tax regime with many of the leading countries coming into existence. At the same time, this was the week that El Salvador decided to make Bitcoin an official currency due to its lack of trust in the dollar, which so has it's been... So interesting in your newsletter this week, you call El Salvador or you... You, you reward El Salvador or you award El Salvador Startup of the Week, which is it, um, yeah. a moniker which everyone wants. And very, I think it's the first time we've ever given it or you've ever given it to a country. Yep, Startup of the Week, El Salvador. I think we once gave it to Africa. Well, that's not a country, Keith. No, I know. Well, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there. No, we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about Africa, but let's talk about El. Sa well, before we get to El Salvador, um, as we speak, uh, I don't know if you've seen the news in the last couple of hours, but there's been an announcement in DC on a, on a, on a fairly strict regime for also uh, taxing and managing the big tech companies uh, in the US. This was inevitable, though. I mean, 
what you call a red light is hardly surprising. Well, I, I think whenever there is huge growth in value, uh, governments are going to look for their piece of it. And uh, the, the, the DC news, uh, I haven't seen it, but I'm assuming it's about Bezos not having paid taxes. And it's about... Well, the- that's part of it. But it's, 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 it's a sort of a, a regulatory initiative, a major regulatory initiative that's been announced. Obviously, it hasn't been asked to get through, but it's, it's, it's an initiative. So, Keith, normally, and you're a driver like me, when you have a green and a red light, you have an amber light too. Are we somewhere between the green and the red when it comes to tech? Or is that the wrong way of thinking of it? Well, that, that, that is the meaning of the word dialectical. It means that there are, there are competing trends. Um, the future is going to be made up based on the outcome of those trends. And at, uh, at, in any given moment, it's pretty hard to predict exact timings and outcomes. So there is no amber light. There is only red and green. But actually, red and green uh, are, are symbols of, of uh, uh, different futures, let's call them. Uh, and, and so and, but there's also the argument which I, I certainly make. I'm not sure you're, you're in this camp that would suggest that more regulation actually stimulates innovation. And it, obviously, if you're part of a $100 billion startup, that's great. But it would be better to, to borrow some language from Chairman Mao, better to have 10,000 startups bloom than just five or 10. So uh, it's yeah. not an either or, is it, when it comes to innovation and regulation? I think they can often go together. Yeah, clear, clearly capitalism is pretty good at incenting innovation it, it it's uh, the, the the you know wealth flowing to individuals who take risk um uh, motivates them to take that risk um governments typically are seen as um party poopers in that context because <clears throat> regulation is often perceived as slowing things down not fixing things it can be both and you also have um as so often in our news or in your newsletter, you have some interesting links on SPACs. SPACs are part of the green light. They're part of innovation, aren't they? They are. SPACs are, are, are um, you know, one, 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 of the, um, one of the facts about the creation of wealth is most people don't get to participate in it. Why? Because in order pr- to protect poorer people from losing their money, the SEC doesn't let poorer people invest in private companies as investors. You have to be what's called a qualified investor. So usually normal people only invest in private companies when they go public through stock exchanges and Robin Hood and things like that. A SPAC is a way for a company to go public earlier in its life than would otherwise be the case and, and, and therefore enable the average Joe to buy shares in those companies when normally only qualified investors would be able to. A direct listing is the same. And there's a couple of other stories this week, one from Mexico where SoftBank has invested in a publicly traded venture fund that that means that normal people can buy stocks and shares in that venture fund. And, uh, and, and yet another one still from the UK where Seraphim Capital, which is a space venture capitalist investing in space-related things also has decided to create a public uh, venture capital vehicle for normal people to invest in. So, you know, one of the big questions as we, as the end of work becomes more and more likely through automation and less and less people are earning salaries, um, it, it, one of the big questions is, if the world as a whole benefits from the abundance of wealth created from automation, how does the ordinary person benefit from that? Is it going to be in the hands of the Jeff Bezoses, or is it going to be more broadly distributed? And um, those, those are really hard questions. I mean, my, my libertarian instinct to leave companies alone to innovate is in complete conflict to my belief that they'll steal all the money if unless you take it off. Them. But I don't get your point about SPACs. I mean, the new one of the pieces of news today uh, in, in your newsletter is about Bill Ackman, the very wealthy, successful hedge fund um, titan, 
who uh, has a SPAC to invest in uh, a music company. Universal. Um, how does that benefit ordinary people? There's nothing democratizing about that. It's just going to result in, Vic, for better or worse, Bill Ackman becoming more richer and richer and his well, friends. Well, actually, the the story of uh, of uh, Ackman is really interesting. He he had the biggest SPAC. $4 billion was raised in a SPAC. Um, and when you have $4 billion, you need to go and find something to merge with. And because you've got $4 billion, that thing needs to be worth, at the very least, I would say $20 billion. So there aren't that many $20 billion companies that are not yet public looking for a merger partner. Yeah. So he ended up failing, uh, and he drew the conclusion that $4 billion was just too much. So what he did is he took the lion's share of that and put it into Universal Music for a 10% share, which is not what a SPAC normally does, and then retained a smaller bit to do a more normal SPAC, like a couple of hundred million. So the, the headline in the Financial Times was that he was – it, this was SPAC 2.0, but really it wasn't. It was failed SPAC 1.0, uh, and he's still doing normal SPACs with what's left of the money after he's put most of it into Universal Music. But Keith, well, uh, in the last couple of episodes, we've talked about uh, Tiger Global and this huge, um, huge funds uh, colonization of, of of the market. Isn't that what's happening with people like? Ackman and and uh, and and Spax is the big money is finding it and blowing everyone else away. That that certainly is true. Uh, Chamath uh, Pal- Palihipitaya this week, um, who's featured in a really interesting New Yorker uh, article. Yeah, he is right. I mean, he well, it, uh, he he's made it. Once you have a whole piece on the New Yorker about you, that's a big deal. So he's yeah. he's a. Uh, uh, he, he's now in the Bezos uh, jobs class. Yeah, but also this week, SoFi, which is his latest SPAC to complete the merger, uh, did go public. And SoFi is now trading, let me just look before I make this up, uh, at $22 a share compared to the SPAC price of $10. So you could have bought Chamath SPAC for $10 a few months ago it's now at $22.40 after the merger with SoFi. He's got two other SPACs lined up, IPOD and IPOF, both of which are trading at $10 today. Um, the, you know, We don't know yet who they're going to merge with, but when they announce that, it's quite likely that those prices will go up. And you and me and anyone else, whether we're qualified investor or not, can go and buy those SPAC. Um, shares now on our E-Trade or Robinhood account. So that's the point I'm making about SPACs opening up investing to normal people. It's not all finance this week, Keith. Interest, some interesting stuff on Facebook and Twitter. You're saying that blogging has been reinvented, uh, not as blogging, but uh, as tweets. Um, uh, and that Twitter now is is way ahead of uh, Facebook in for the creative community. So what's happening on this front? So this, this is a, actually a debate um, and uh, um, between um, the uh, uh, rethinking news who wrote a, a historical piece really describing the move from blogging to Twitter as the primary way that creators communicate with the world. Um, and and in that article he had. Um, some screenshots of some old blogs that were basically tweet length yeah. uh, posts. And O Malik wrote a lengthy ripost, uh, disagreeing entirely with that and uh, championing the blog as a form of writing that um, is way more important and better than Twitter. So I, I titled the section, What is a Creator to Do?, you know, so should you have a newsletter? Should you have a blog? Should you tweet? Should you do what we're doing, which is have a newsletter and a video and a podcast? I think you have to have everything, right? I mean, anyone who can just rely on a blog or a tweet. And isn't that what you said last week Twitter is trying to do is aggregate all this technology and functionality on one platform so you can do everything simultaneously? Yeah, actually, actually they made an announcement yesterday that 
if you have a newsletter that is uh, published using the review uh, uh, newsletter platform that they acquired recently, they're going to put a subscribe to my newsletter button on your Twitter profile, which is, uh, you know, even further evidence that they're trying to integrate all the tools a creator needs to address an audience. And so what get- reason is there for all of us to stay on Substack and not to go over to Twitter? You said that review is still not quite as good as Substack in terms of functionality. Yeah, that's that's still true, although it, it's getting better. Like this week, they made it possible that when I publish my newsletter now, I can decide which image goes in the tweet that accompanies it, which I couldn't do previously. And is so that going to be automated with Twitter and um, review? So if, if, if I go over to, if I take my Substack stuff and go over to Twitter, it will just automatically under my profile yeah yeah exactly and 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 i suspect there'll soon be video production tools and you know everything because i think twitter is turning into portal meets creative platform um where everything you ever want to read need to read need to listen to or view is going to be there including live audio on spaces so they yeah. really so they so they they've got a, a multi war going on versus Substack and Clubhouse and Facebook. Yep, and and it's a it is a renaissance for Twitter. I mean, Twitter has languished as the same tech for years now. So somebody, and I'd love to know who inside Twitter, has come up with a product roadmap and a coherent strategy that they appear to be executing against. But it's still a minority. I mean, still most of the most of the content on Twitter is not by people operating different kinds of media platforms or products. Or, it's just yeah. people tweeting about one celebrity or another, or one sports game or another. So I'm not sure how much it actually affects their real business. I can see it as a way of monetizing. I mean, I'm more than ha- I'd be more than happy to pay Twitter twenty or thirty dollars a month if they could bring all my stuff together and I could just do it all from there. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, you know, there's a, you're right about the content. The, the Twitter has a long tail of content, most of which you and I would never see. Um, but the stuff we do see is getting more professionally produced and, uh, uh, and um, easier to consume, let's say. Well, I know that everyone is waiting for the startup of the week, and that is the... Central American country of El Salvador, Keith. What, are, what has El Salvador been up to this week that that has uh, resulted in them being awarded Startup of the Week? El Salvador, would you believe, has announced that it is adopting Bitcoin as an official currency. And, and you're uh, the one who's always been telling me every time I bring this up that Bitcoin is not a currency, but clearly the El Salvador people believe it is. Yeah, I, I, I suspect the word currency is being loosely used in this context because uh, I think most El Salvadorians, here's the, here's the interesting bit. The first is like a global economics reason why it's interesting, which is for a developing country to opt out of the dollar as the standard for storing values prefigures what a lot of developing countries might think of doing because their own currencies are very weak. And yeah. um, despite its volatility, Bitcoin is a lot stronger than their local cur- currencies. And I do think there's there's going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting to watch how many other countries do this. Iran, for example, yesterday announced that they are going to legalize Bitcoin. Um, uh, and I think almost every let's say, not necessarily anti-American, but non-American yeah. nation, it's going to start to be more and more attractive to do this. And I think quite a few might. So yeah, I, I don't know if you listened to uh, Meet the Press last week on last Sunday, but um, there they were very much associating uh, blockchain, uh, cryptocurrency with destabilizing the international system, with the dark web and unaccountability. So this is increasingly becoming a political issue. It's going to be really interesting. Yeah, and here's this is a map of the next places that might, you know, might consider doing that. And uh, you know, El Salvador is a tiny blip that you don't even see in Central America. Um, but the world as a whole is full of countries with weak currencies that 
uh, have to figure out a good play in this new global economy. And um, so this is a really good article, Bitcoin Legal Tender, is it a financial earthquake for dollarization? It's a very long article on, on trustnose.com and it's in the newsletter. And I'd put that before the El Salvador story just because it gives some good context to it. Yeah, I'm increasingly convinced that the the cryptocurrency mania or story and the decline of the dollar and the structural changes in the world economy in the 21st century, they're all linked. They're, they're not separate and they're not arbitrary. They're not... Uh, in 20, 20 or 25 years, the connections, I'm not sure if anyone can make them obviously now, but they will be more obvious in 20 years. Yeah, the, well, I think the key thing bubbling under is something called DeFi, distributed finance, which we've talked about before. But um, And it relates to El Salvador. The president of El Salvador, in motivating his um, proposal, talked about the fact that most El Salvadorians don't have a bank account but they do have a, a smartphone. And he talked about how could they have money on their smartphone that they could spend when they don't have a bank account or a credit card. And actually, Bitcoin is a way to do that. So uh, DeFi is a way to get rid of middlemen in finance so that each individual and their smartphone is their own bank uh, and, and carries around the custody of their own value and can spend it. India kind of took a first step towards that a few years ago when it digitized its currency um, and its population identity um, in the national system. So there's some really, really interesting trends buried inside there that um, I don't think the world yet knows how valuable. And I, I'd be definitely, you know, some of the DeFi companies have raised big sums of money in the last few weeks. And to me, it's not surprising. Yeah, to go back to your your friend uh, Hegel, the inventor of the dialectic, um, these things um, the, 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 these things only become clear at dusk. The owl of Minerva, uh, Hegel famously said, only comes out at dusk, and we're certainly not at dusk when it comes to cryptocurrency. We are, however, at the dusk of our show, Keith, because I know you you have an orgy that you need to attend in the next <laughs> few minutes. Um, so finally, we've done Startup of the Week, which is El Salvador. What about Tweet of the Week? Tweet of the Week being more and more meaningful because of Twitter's more, a more central role in our media ecosystem. So the Tweet of the Week um, is linked to an Economist article titled, If Only We Could Turn Back Time. And what it shows is uh, the shrinking of Europe in the world economy as a player. Um, the, 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 the tweet is, um, the tweet is uh, just pointing to the article. And um, the land that ambition forgot. And it, it's basically uh, our homeland, Andrew, yours and mine. Well, we're not in Europe anymore, though, are we? Uh, the British, anyway, didn't we get out? Uh, is, is UK included? Is it, or is it just U, U, UK is indeed included in, in, in this map. So it's um, the, the dark red at the top is Asia Pacific. The light red that is big is China. And then you've got the US. US, by the way, is still growing in terms of the top 100 companies by market capitalization due to the tech 100 billionaires, many of which are American. So uh, the U.S. is, is are they all doing... going into space? No, um, will there be a, a, a space one for this for Bezos and Musk when they go and live on Mars? Uh, there, there probably will be. Um, there probably will be. I think that was Bezos calling me to see if I wanted to go on the spaceship with him. He's probably calling from Mars. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, he's it's calling probably... actually to invite you to the orgy. I think we're going to have to shut this thing down now so that Keith Tier can go off and do whatever naughty things he does on a Friday afternoon, because that was the week for the week of June the 11th, 2021. We'll be back next Friday, June 18th, with more SPACs, more Elad, what's his name? Elad Gill? Elad Gill. Um, Elad Gill, more crypto, more disruption, more Keith Tier, more mixed signals. Great week, Keith. Keep well, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye, everyone.